um, good morning. Uh, first of all, I'll start off. Are there any questions? About, yes. Okay, so the question had to do with reading. So on the uh, course website, uh, have you been there? Maybe not. There's a the the place where you actually see the um, the lecture material as it's posted. I believe there should also be the chapter uh, from the Cam the Big Thick Campbell Biology textbook. It's also indicated there, right? Now remember the the readings from the textbook. I'm thinking of as just background material. It's not required. Um, it's one of the frustrations with this course is that it's a very expensive book and different people that teach bio, biology 1A and 1B have different feelings about whether it's required or what types of books to be reading. Um, and frankly, I'm not that impressed by Campbell's evolution treatment, so uh, I'm not super enthusiastic about assigning readings from it. Any other questions? Okay, we also had a request. Oh, oh go ahead. Yeah. Uh, for some things, um, but no, I don't have a, the direct correspondence. We could probably work that out, um, but I, I don't have them with me. It's certainly not on the top of my head. I, the problem is I need a seventh. Yeah, the problem is I need a seventh edition for me to be able to make the correspondences, you know, corresponding chapters. I don't have that. They give me, you know, they, I get free textbooks, but it's, it's the ones they want me to assign to because they make lots of money off off these books, as you can imagine. Other questions? Okay, we had a request. Um, there's a number of people that are here and impaired uh, that are taking this course, and so we have a, a person who's signing the. Um, is that right? Or I'm sorry. Captioning. captioning. Okay, uh, captioning these, and so she finds it difficult, like when you come in late, if the door slams, um, to hear what I'm saying, at least during the slamming portion of the door close. So if you're coming in late, try to. Um, I'm not picking on you or anything, but try to uh, try to be gentle. And uh, now I'm going to be completely distracted the entire lecture by people coming in and slamming the doors potentially. But it does, doesn't bother me, but it is hard to, for her to hear what's going on. Um, so I'm going to continue with the last lecture where we were talking about uh, Darwin and the origin of species. I want to finish that up, and then we'll be starting our discussion of population genetics. Okay? And I'd stopped the, or the last thing we were saying in the lecture last time, or I was saying in the lecture last time, was. Um, you know, he had this theory that describes adaptation, right? That's natural selection. But a good theory often can bring in other facts as well. It can actually explain more than it was originally intended to explain. And that's true for uh, Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection as well. And so I spoke a little bit about biogeography. I'll, I'll return to that. Um, but some other uh, facts that, that uh, and he could also explain the fossil record. So just go through things that Darwin could explain really easily. Well, I, I, last lecture I lamented a lot about how incomplete the fossil record is, but what is known about it and what's known at the, at the time of Darwin's published The Origin of Species is consistent with his theory. Okay, and specifically, people had a very good idea of the sequence of, uh, or the progression of organisms in different rock strata. So it was known that trilobites and things from the Paleozoic occur in certain rocks, and the rocks above them had different fossils, and up to the ones, the rocks that were the most recent, they had their own assemblage of fossils, and the fossils in the most recent rocks, the, the youngest rocks, most closely resembled uh, living species. Okay, and that was consistent with, uh, with uh, Darwin's theory. Okay, another thing that he pointed out is that the Linnaean classification system, which by that time had been the, the standard way that people classified species, was also consistent with um, the theory of evolution. So uh, I don't know if you, you should probably know this, the, the Linnaean hierarchy, but it's kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. So every named species on Earth of course, the, we're, we're, it's given a genus and a species name. We're Homo sapiens. And the typical thing is you always capitalize the H in the genus, even if it's not starting a sentence. And the species name, oh, Homo sapiens, what am I talking about? And the species name is, is lowercase. Okay? 
Anyways, we're all given a Latin binomial. That's the Latin binomial name. But we're also in a family, an order, a class, a phylum, and a kingdom. Okay, like, for instance, the kingdom Animalia. And this classification uh, scheme was the devised by a, a Swedish uh, scientist, Linnaeus, uh, Linné. And, um, and, of course, he's very famous in Sweden. Even today, he's like their, their hero there. Um, but this is, this is the Linnaean classification scheme, and it's a hierarchical scheme. Okay, there's a hierarchy. Every, you know, a lot of species fall into a, a, into a kingdom, different phyla, for instance, in a kingdom, a bunch of different classes are contained within phyla and so forth. And Darwin pointed out that this scheme, which seemed a natural one to the people at the time, and it's still one that's hard to get rid of, uh, seemed, to, seemed to explain, uh, could be easily explained by evolution. That is to say that things that were they were very closely related, that it was very similar and people had grouped into, into the same genus, well, that was because those things happened to be more closely related to one another, phylogenetically. A phylogeny is a, is a genealogical relationship, so sometimes I say the word phylogeny without, without having to find it, but now I have. A phylo phylogeny represents the relationships of species, and so things in the different genera in the same family, well, the argument is that they're similar to one another because, um, and they're grouped together in the same family because they're, they're each other's closest relatives. They're very closely related, at least. Okay. Oh, and, and this is something you, you should know. There's actually an easy way of remembering it. You may have learned this from high school. At least this is how I learned it. You know, King Philip came over from German shores. And somebody, you probably have a different one. I know there's a number of them out there. What's that? All right, well, I don't, we don't need to hear any of this, but King Philip came over from German shores, works. Um, so anyways, the Linnaean classification scheme is, is consistent with um, what is known about evolution. And then, of course, biogeography. That is to say, how species are distributed on the Earth. And the, the basic observation, this is what I ended with, is there we go. I can't, don't have an ability to use a pointer here, so I'm going to use this, uh, this one that's hard to see um, uh, in, the, in the projections. But um, anyways, that, that species that are closely related to, that are, uh, that are similar in habit the same area of Earth. So this, an example is New World and Old World monkeys. I, this is what I ended with. Um, basically, you have a lot of monkeys called New World monkeys, the platyrines that live in the New World, South Africa, South America, rather. And they all have three premolars. And you have the Old World monkeys, the catarine monkeys, that live in Europe, Africa, Asia, and have two premolars. The reason why you have these two groups distributed not randomly, right, is because the platyrines have their common ancestor on in the New World, in South America probably, whereas the catarine monkeys have their common ancestor in the New World, in the Old World. There's another other type of observations that Darwin made. So, for instance, the distribution on, on islands of species is quite peculiar, okay, and it can best be explained by different islands having a history of colonization. So, uh, oceanic islands, for instance, these are islands that often are formed by volcanoes. That is to say, a volcano finally pops above the surface of the ocean. Once it does that, you have new land that can be colonized by plants and animals. Um, oceanic islands have a very low diversity of kinds. So, for instance, there's only 29 bird species on the Galapagos versus if you just go to the Berkeley campus, you can see over 100. Um, there's a bias in the types of, um, of, of birds. So you have a bunch of different finch, finches on the, on the Galapagos Islands, right? Whereas here you have all sorts of different groups of species uh, represented on, on the Berkeley campus. It's also the case that the most similar kinds of, of, of to the oceanic island forms, so for instance, the closest relative of the birds on the Galapagos are found on the South American mainland. They're not found in Africa, they're not found in Europe, they're found on the west coast of South, South America. Okay. And that's true for the turtles as well. The, the closest relatives of the Galapagos tortoises, giant tortoises, is, is it the Chaco tortoise? But it's a South American tortoise, okay, which is kind of interesting. Um, the argument being that the reason why the closest relatives to the Galapagos birds or turtles is, is, is found in South America is, is that's where they're colonized from. These islands were colonized by turtles and birds that came from South America. And there's also a, a real bias of types of species that are found in oceanic islands. So for instance, you see lots of plants and insects and birds and some reptiles. But what you don't find 
is amphibians, freshwater fish. You usually don't see mammals unless they're reintroduced later like they were on the Galapagos, like rats. And you don't see most types of reptiles. The argument is that some of these types of species can actually traverse oceans quite easily and others can't. So for instance, amphibians have a real hard time tolerating salt water, as do freshwater fish, as you might imagine. Um, uh, like tortoises are, are quite hardy, hardy animals. You can probably throw a tortoise into the ocean and it'll survive for a month. Right, it's not a very pleasant thing to do to the tortoise, but they, they can live for a long time without food and water. We have a tortoise, like I said, that wanders in our backyard, and we just leave for weeks at a time, and he just eats the grass, doesn't eat water because he gets all his moisture from the grass. Um, birds are obviously good, good dispersers. Plants are quite good dispersers, and Darwin did all sorts of very interesting experiments in his study where he'd take different seeds from different plants. He, in fact, he wrote to all sorts of different farmers, can I get seeds of this type of crop or that type of plant? And, and he'd just drop them into salt water, and he'd leave them in there for months at a time, and they'd take them out and see if they'd germinate. Right? And, and his argument was that many of these plant species, their seeds would germinate after months in the water. And he, ar he made little calculations about how far a seed could disperse in the oceanic currents uh, in a month or two months. Okay? So anyways, the argument is that a lot of these, these, uh, these islands can be explained as having a history. And the subsequent, the fact that you have lots of turtles that are very closely related to one another or birds that are closely related to each other is that the speciation happened within those lucky survivors that got to the island. And so that's why you have so many different types of finch, for instance, on the Galapagos. Okay, this is a, a little bit, some other things that Darwin could explain. This is the only figure in the origin of species, and it shows a sort of uh, branching uh, tree uh, representing the relationships of some hypothetical species. This isn't the relationships of any specific species, but he's using this as a, as a graphic way for the reader to see what he means by a phylogeny or relationship. And besides, um, you know, besides being able to explain the Linnaean hierarchy, he could also explain what, was known, what's, what, what are known as homologous structures in different species. So this is a, a classic example you'll see over and over again in any textbook illustrating homology. So homology is a similarity in the structure in different organisms that's caused by a common ancestry. Okay. So he could explain homology. I better write that on the board. This is a, a free, free thing that falls out of, out of his theory. And the argument is that in a lot of vertebrates, you see this pattern where you have a forelimb. You have two sets of limbs, forelimbs and hindlimbs. The forelimb has this pattern where you have one bone followed by two bones followed by a bunch of small bones and some long bones, right? We all know, I mean, a lot of you guys are going to be going off to medical school. I'm sure you'll name, learn the names of the parts, but that's the pattern you see, right? One bone, two bones, a bunch of little bones. And you see that in different species. Here's a mole, here's a horse, here's a dolphin, there's a bat. Okay? One bone followed by two bones, followed by a bunch of few small bones uh, with five long skinny bones. Okay? Why do we have the similar pattern in different, different uh, vertebrates? Well, the argument is their ancestor had that same pattern as well. Now that is, this is something that was understood even at Darwin's time. At Darwin's time, the people were really starting to understand the anatomy of different organisms. Things were being shipped to London from all over the world at the time. And people were starting to understand the similarities to the structures across different species. And also they were starting to understand the development of the species, which all, which all, uh, you know, how, how a single cell turns into a full adult, adult organism. I'll get to that in a second. Now we also have examples of modern homology. I just want to give you an idea of what I mean by that. So here are some different species, and what I have listed along here in this table are different genes. So this is the alpha enolase. I don't know what that one is. This is probably comodulin. These are all just the names of different genes. And you'll see here they have a psi uh, at the end. These are uh, what are called pseudogenes. What is a pseudogene? Well, it's a, it's a gene that was replicated. You, know, you take a functioning gene, you replicate it, you put it elsewhere in the genome, and there's a, a number of mechanisms by which this can occur. But one of two things can happen when that replication occurs, when that duplication occurs. Either you have a functioning version of this gene, right, in which case you have two copies of this functioning gene, and then you have the opportunity for the functions of the two genes to diverge. And that's one of the main arguments for why we have so many different types of genes functioning in, the, in, in ourselves. We have it's through a, a history of duplication and then functional specialization. But the other thing that can happen, and far more commonly what happens, is the replicated gene is not functional. It doesn't have all the all the material, all the bits and pieces that tell the, you know, that this bit needs to be transcribed and translated, okay? 
So what happens then to this, this little replicated piece of DNA? Well, natural selection isn't, doesn't care about it anymore, right? In the normal copy of the gene, if you, if you break a protein, if you change an amino acid in, that's coded for in the normal piece of DNA, you probably break the protein, right? And natural selection tends to eliminate those types of mutations from the population. In this replicated bit of DNA, if you change an, a nucleotide there, natural selection doesn't care. It doesn't have any function at all, right? So what happens is these, these pseudogenes start to become more and more like the background bit of the genome. In fact, after a certain amount of time, they're very difficult to even recognize, even identify as being pseudogenes, because there's no signature that would allow you to actually represent or recognize that this little bit of DNA is similar to this functional bit of DNA. Now, is that clear, what I mean by a pseudogene? Okay. This is one of the few times where I wish I had, there's a clicker system. This is where I would have asked you a question and you would have been able to respond. I would have known whether you understood it. But I think it's pretty clear. So these are different pseudogenes. And notice the pattern uh, that you see these pseudogenes, um, the sharing among these different species. So for instance, in human chimps and gorilla, you have this, per this specific alpha enolase uh, psi 1 gene. It's estimated age at which the duplication occurred is about 11 million years ago. Here you have this comodulin 2, pseudogene 3. It is thought to have diverged about 36 million years ago. And notice the pattern of sharing. There's more species, including hamsters, or no, that monkey, including this monkey here, that has that pseudogene. Okay? The argument is that these, this, this pattern is consistent with what's known of the phylogeny. That is to say, the human, chimp, and gorilla are each other's closest relatives. This pattern isn't, is it? Well, actually, the, the orangutan is up there as well. There's some uncertainty about the relationships of gorillas and orangs and with humans and chimps. But you have the, the, the great apes here, then you have primates here, right? So you see this pattern of sharing uh, in which uh, some species might have the pseudogenum, some might not. This, this pattern is also consistent with there being an underlying history. Now, I want to mention a little bit about what was known, or about developmental biology. Ah, uh, walk out. Well, you guys can walk out if you want tomorrow, or Thursday, rather, I guess. So, where was I? So, number five. His theory was consistent what, with, with what was known at the time about development. So the, the, the observation was that very disparate species, things that are quite different looking as adults, go through very similar patterns in their, in their early embryogenesis. For instance, a lot of species undergo a process called gastrulation, which is sort of the turning inside out of, of the uh, developing embryo, okay? A lot of vertebrates, all vertebrates, have a notochord, okay, that forms and it forms in a very specific way. There's an invagination and folding over of cells along the, the dorsal part of the developing embryo. That's something that's shared across species that look quite different, okay? Now, our Darwin says, look, you know, the one way of explaining why we have these very similar patterns of development among really different looking species is because they all shared a common ancestor that had that, that same pattern of development. Now, since then, this is one of the most fabulous success stories probably in, in modern biology. We've learned that these patterns of similarities go much deeper and much wider than we ever imagined possible. So you don't have to remember this, first of all, right? So if this looks complicated, don't worry. I just want to make a general argument. If you're interested in developmental biology, and, a, and it's really a fascinating field, there are specialized courses that molecular cell biology teaches on developmental biology, which is fascinating. But one thing that's known is how, for instance, the, the Drosophila, the, 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 the fruit fly, People have studied that for, well, a century now, and a lot is known about how Drosophila develops. Basically, what happens is you have an embryo, and you have some genes that are expressed early on that set up the segmented pattern of the embryo, and then what you have is specific genes that are turned on in certain segments, okay? These genes that are turned on in different segments are called homeotic genes, okay? And the interesting thing about these homeotic genes is there's several of them. And you can imagine that it's almost like a light board. Which genes are turned on, which of these homeotic genes are turned on in a certain segment have an effect downstream on other genes that turn that segment into an antenna or a wing or whatever, right? But that's, it's these homeotic genes that give different segments of the Drosophila its identity. You're a head. You're the tail segment. You're a wing segment, okay? And so this is just showing some of these different uh, uh, homeobox genes. So homeotic genes, the antennapedia complex, so there's a labial gene, there's a deformed gene, there's sex <coughs> reduced, and showing where these genes are normally expressed. Where is it? 
go on to the next slide. And the one cool thing, I love these, these this is the mutations in these genes cause crazy, mutation, uh, crazy uh, phenotypes. So for instance, everybody knows, perhaps you don't, that flies have two wings, one pair of wings, right? So you have a, usually you have this pattern where you have four wings, and these hind wings are typically called haltiers. They're just little tiny stubs that are called balancing organs. They just go up and down, uh, counter to the wing motion. Here's an example where, in a, one of these homeotic genes, where the, th where the third thoracic segment, that's this one, looks just like the seg second one. Okay, so you have the, it's basically the expression turns posterior segments to make them look more like anterior segments. Here's another crazy mutation, home homeotic mutation, that turns the antenna into legs, right? That's a weird thing, okay? But they're, they're cool mutations. Well, here is the homeotic, so it turns out that vertebrates, we have homeotic genes as well. We don't call them homeotic genes, we call them Hox genes, because they're discovered independently, but they're the same genes, they're homologous. That is to say, our common ancestor of flies and humans had homeotic genes. And interestingly, they have the same pattern where, you know, there's genes that are expressed early on that set up the segmented pattern in humans. We're segmented, believe it or not. But also, these homeotic genes are expressed you know, in different regions of the body. And mutations in these genes have the same effect as they do in Drosophila. That is to say, they make posterior segments look more like anterior segments. So here's an example in which the hindbrain expands because it's making this segment back here look more like the, the, the brain right here. So here's the normal phenotype. Here's the mutant form phenotype. Okay, so that's a, another thing that um, Darwin could explain real easily. Uh, the developmental patterns. Number six. He could easily explain vestigial and rudimentary structures. So here, if you, these are, if you go to like the uh, Cal Academy of Sciences, they have a big whale. And I believe, it's whale skeleton rather. <laughs> and I believe um, they actually have suspended, they've actually included the pelvic bones in this whale. So typically what happens if you see a whale skeleton, if it's done right, they'll basically suspend from wires in about the right place where they would be in the interior part of the whale where these pelvic bones are. What these are is these are the rudimentary parts of their hind, limb, hind limbs, right? You have the bones of the pelvis followed by just the rud rudimentary parts of the, of the femur. That's all there is left. Why are these bones there? They don't serve any purpose at all in the whale. The argument here is that these, this, these, these uh, vestigial structures here are there only uh, because the common ancestor of whales happened to have had hind legs. It was a vertebrate. that used to be on land. They moved to water. Okay, now, I mentioned last time that there are examples of whales that have hind limbs, right? They're about 50 million years old. Um, but this is all that we, modern whales don't have hind limbs. I imagine if they were sort of, if, you, if they did, they would be just a drag, so to speak. They would actually uh, slow down the whale. And here, this is a, I don't want to call it a vestigial structure, but this is an example, uh, something that was discovered in the 1960s of a homologous structure that's shared across all of life. Okay? And that is the, the, the so-called universal genetic code. Now, it turns out the universal genetic code, there's variations on it, small variations, like in the human mitochondria or vertebrate mitochondria, there's a slightly different variant of the genetic code. But for the most part, all different organisms, bacteria, humans, everything, share this code. And basically, all this is, is remember the, the, the basic stories you have your, your uh, proteins are coded for in the DNA, right? And every triplet of nucleotide is it codes for one amino acid in the protein. So the, the typical thing that happens is you have that DNA transcribed into messenger RNA, and the messenger RNA is often spliced and then read uh, by uh, translational machinery to, to uh, form proteins. Okay, now, if you're not familiar with that, don't worry. You should be familiar with it if you took high school biology, but if you're not, it's not important. The main point is that each amino acid in a protein is coded for by a triplet of nucleotides in the DNA, and so you can imagine, and there's 64 possible triplets, four raised to the third power, four times four times four, there's 20 different amino acids. There's some redundancy in the genetic code, meaning that there's some triplets that code for the same amino acid, sometimes up to six different triplets that'll code for the same amino acid, but it's shared. That's a remarkable thing. And, and the interesting thing is we can easily imagine a different genetic code, right? You know, now, if we were to change the genetic code willy-nilly right now, every one of our proteins wouldn't work, and that would be a very bad mutation. But Early on, when the genetic code must have first evolved, 
there were probably different ways you could have had a genetic code that, had, uh, that would have been equally good. It's just, it's sort of, in some ways, it's just an arbitrary chance that this genetic code was chosen and not some other by evolution. Okay? But the main point is this is something that's been conserved for billions of years. Okay. Are there any questions up to this point right now? I want to turn my attention, so that, that's all I want to say about the Darwin and the origin of species, right? There's a lot, to, you know, two lectures worth of material, actually more than two. Um, I wanted to give you the background of the basic ideas, but from now on, and give you an idea for why Darwin is, is you know, like I said, a certifiable great man. He actually had a huge influence uh, in, in modern biology. Um, but that said, the, the field has changed a lot since Darwin, okay? The field, I mean, Darwin had no idea about inheritance. He said that things, that, that offspring resembled parents, but that's about all he could do. He didn't know why they resembled parents, right? And in fact, it was, it, you know, some people argued, well, you know, it, this is a, a great theory, but it depends critically on how uh, inheritance works. How does it work? And in some of the later editions of The Origin of Species, Darwin came up with a theory that just was just flat wrong. All right, so actually the earlier editions of The Origin of the Species are the more interesting ones to read because they don't have this, this wrong theory in it about how inheritance works. Interestingly, you've, you've all heard of Gregor Mendel, who is the father of Mendelian genetics, you know, he's of genetics. Darwin did have a copy of the famous 1865 manuscript that Mendel wrote in his office, right? And it's always been a great speculation about whether he read it or not. Now, I'd heard as a, as a grad student that he never read it because in the old days, um, manu you know, they, they would come to, you could, ha you could tell the publisher, look, I want this manuscript sent to these different people. They'd send it to these different people for you, and they'd send it in what's called an uncut state, where you'd have to sort of slice the front edge so you could actually open it up. And I'd heard that it was unsliced or un unopened, but I talked like two years ago to a Darwin scholar, and that's why I always told students, which was wrong, it turns out. It turns out it was, it was sliced. He could have potentially read it. So it's possible he read it and didn't understand the ramifications of, the, of what he'd read. Or it's possible it was just in his office, and like a lot of things in your office, in my office at least, I haven't even looked at. Okay. Um, so, uh, so there's great speculation, but in any case, he didn't, he didn't see, he didn't understand, he had the wrong theory of inheritance. But the theory itself is, has survived uh, you know, several great discoveries in biology, the first of which is this discovery of genetics, inheritance, how it actually works. The theory not only survived it, but it became stronger. In fact, you know, the stuff I'll be talking about, population genetics, is basically how Mendelian ge genes uh, act in populations. Okay? And the modern view of, of evolution is that evolution is change in gene frequencies over time. Okay? So the, the theory became stronger after the discovery of Mendelian genetics. It became stronger still when people discovered the structure of DNA, and of course today um, uh, you know, we have full, full genome sequences. It's almost impossible to understand a genome without uh, without evolution. It, it's, it, why would we have parasitic elements in our genome, for instance, which we do, lots of them, uh, except, except to say that it's, it's just a spread of selfish genetic elements through the genome. So the, the theory has become stronger, not weaker, with um, each discovery in modern biology. Now, the, what was the reaction of, to the origin of species immediately afterwards? Well, I would argue that most scientists accepted the fact of evolution. That is, that species change over time. They said, look, you've amassed a lot of evidence, and I believe that part of it. What they didn't necessarily agree with Darwin was his most original contribution, which was natural selection. A lot of people argued at that time, especially in the late 1800s, that there must be some other mechanism that's, that's causing adaptation in, 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 in addition to natural selection. And they also disagreed with Darwin about the pattern of evolution. So remember, you have uh, some trait here in time. And Darwin argued that you should see very gradual change in a trait. And he, he um, explained gaps in the evolution of some trait uh, as, as basically due to the imperfection of the, of the fossil record. Other people said, well, why does it have to be continuous like that? Why does it have to be gradual and continuous? Why couldn't it be uh, sort of punctuated by very rapid bursts of change? So this would be an example of a period of very rapid change uh, before which you had stasis and after which you had stasis, okay? Um, actually, this would be the rapid change, rapid change, this would be the stasis. Uh, so some people argued that this might be a pattern as well that would be perfectly valid. In fact, this would also be consistent with the fossil record, right? 
what was known of it at the time, and in fact, what's known for most species today. Now, I think, just to, as an aside, I think the modern understanding is that rates change. Some traits ex, you know, evolve very rapidly, some don't change very much at all. So it depends on the characteristic you're looking at. But at the time, people debated Darwin about the, um, about the pattern as well. I, I did mention that Darwin did not have a, a convincing mechanism for inheritance. Um, and some people did criticize the theory for that very reason. But it turns out, 1865, you had Mendel's uh, discovery. 35 years of basically his work was ignored. Okay, so he discovers you know, basically how uh, inheritance works. Uh, his discovery is, is ignored for uh, 35 years, and it's rediscovered in the, about 1900. Okay? And so that's when the modern field of genetics uh, was born, essentially, is about 1900. Now, from our perspective, what do we need to know? We need to know that there's locus, a locus, which is sometimes called a gene. Okay? And there's different variants at a locus, which we call alleles. Now, what is a, a locus can be, it can mean a bunch of different things. Um, so it could be a full gene, but it, today, nowadays, with um, you know, sequencing being as cheap as it is, it's often uh, what's called a, a SNP, or a SNP locus. A SNP is a, a single nucleotide position in the genome that potentially varies, where you see some organisms have an A there, others might have a C, G, or T, okay? So today, the resolution of a locus, what we mean by locus, can be down to a single nucleotide, which of course is as small as you can make a locus. Does everybody know what I meant by nucleotide? That you, know, you have a chromosomes that are made of DNA, and it's a one long strand, and, and the nucleotides are usually abbreviated, abbreviated A, C, G, or T. Okay? And so a gene is usually one segment of that, uh, of that chromosome, as a specific set of nucleotides, ACGs, and Ts, and that the, uh, the different variants at that locus um, that, are, that are present in a population are called alleles. Okay? And like I said, the, the smallest locus can be a single nucleotide change, where maybe some species have an A here and others have a C there. Okay? That's the smallest. So you have parts of the chromosomes and you have variants. You have uh, another thing you should know is genotype. That is the specific combination of alleles that some individual has at a locus. Now remember, uh, we're diploid species. That is to say, we have uh, two, two copies of every, every gene, one from mom, one from dad. So for it, the genotype is actually described as a pair. The two alleles you have, the allele you have from mom and the allele you have from dad. So for instance, in Mendel's um, notation, you might have the big A allele might be uh, one of the alleles that's possible at some locus. And so if you got the same variant of the allele from mom and from dad, then you'd be called big A, big A, and this is called a homozygous individual. Another possibility is you got one variant of the allele from mom and another variant of the allele from dad. And these individuals are called heterozygous. And of course, you can have this pattern as well, little a, little a, be homozygous for the other variant of the, of the allele. Okay, this is all stuff you probably have heard of, but I'm just making certain you've, you've got it. So that's the genotype. These are the different possible genotypes when you have two different, two different alleles in a population. And the other thing you should know is the phenotypes. This is the, this is the thing that's actually visible to you as the scientist, directly visible by eye. Right? This is the trait. So um, it could be, for instance, that little a, little a is an eye color. Maybe you have blue eyes if you have little a, little a, and brown eyes if you have big A, big A, and maybe you have brown eyes if you have big A, little a. Okay? So that would be an example of a phenotype, the thing you actually see. Blonde hair would be a phenotype. Brown eyes, blue eyes. Your height is a phenotype. Okay? I think that'll get us started. Oh, and then we have this pattern, that what we call dominance. Mendelian dominance. And so this is the, the idea that sometimes a phenotype is completely determined by just having a, at least one copy of an allele. So for instance, in the example I just gave with brown eyes and blue eyes, 
uh, brown would be called, is, is said to be the dominant allele, because all you need is one copy of that allele to have the trait, the phenotype. So, uh, so this, this big A here would be the, the, the heterozygous and the homozygous individuals that have a big A allele uh, uh, would have the brown eyes. A is said to be dominant to little a. Big A is said to be dominant to little a. Okay, so I think that's all I wanted to say for the background. So population genetics, I've been describing it as the mathy part of evolution. So population genetics is the study of Mendelian genes in populations. So hopefully you know what a gene is, or a you know, Mendelian gene. Uh, what is a population? Well, a population is a, is a group of individuals, all of which can mate with one another. And the usual argument is that there's what's called random mating. Now, I don't know what you're thinking right now. This isn't, this isn't like a fraternity party or anything like that. This is, this is the idea that, the, that your mate choice doesn't depend on the allele or the gene that's in question, all right? So one way of thinking about it, which would be kind of a weird way of thinking about it, but you know, the, the individual you mate with is sort of like a lottery. You give all, if you're a female, you give all the males a lottery ticket, right, numbered from one to whatever, one million or something, and then you roll some dice uh, that would determine which of those million tickets you, you're gonna mate with. This isn't how people really do it clearly, but that would be one way of thinking about random mating, okay? So I, often I like to sort of make my populations as little circles. There's our population. And you have individuals in the population all randomly mating with one another. And they're at least potentially isolated from other such populations. So every species is composed of at least one population. Okay, at least one population. But you can imagine there's other populations as well, and that there's some amount of interchange between the populations. This is the, this is the view I'm gonna start to build up. Now, the, the, the population is a very slippery idea. There's this ideal variant of the population that you can think of a population as a model for what's really happening. And scientists are always very interested in devi devising models. So what is a model? It's just the, it's just an abstract way of thinking about a process. And usually the key components of a model, in fact, the way you make a model useful to scientists, is you want to extract the most basic uh, parts of the phenomenon you're trying to study. You don't try to do everything. You don't try to explain every single aspect of the phenomenon you're studying. You only take those parts you think are most important and you put it into the model. So from our perspective, a population is a model for what's really happening. We realize in practice that things they're much more complicated than that, but it's a model. Now, it turns out that even though this is a model and it's not a perfect description of what happens within a species, uh, it doesn't usually matter very much. In, in practice, what a population is, is whatever organisms you happen to have, have in hand. So you'll often hear people, not evolutionary biologists necessarily, but you'll often hear statements such as the population of San Francisco, right? So the pop, I mean, when people talk like that, they're not, they don't believe that San Francisco is a population of randomly mating individuals isolated from other such populations. It's not like people from San Francisco don't come to the East Bay, for instance. It's just a, it's a, it's an administrative um, convenience to talk about in that way, right? And, uh, and for lots of purposes, thinking about populations in that way are perfectly fine. And so we'll talk a lot about populations, but um, keep in mind there's a difference between what a model is in theory, or what a population is in theory, and what people do in practice. Often you'll, you'll, you know, in, in this building, for instance, you have people studying gophers, and they'll be studying populations of gophers that appear on, or that occur on different hills or mountain slopes, for instance. It's perfectly valid to think about populations in that sense. So that's what a population is. Um, okay. So I talked about also about. Um, all this stuff, genotypes, phenotypes, alleles. The last thing I want to mention are allele frequencies. I 
as you might imagine, an allele frequency is just the frequency of some particular allele in a population of organisms. And the modern view of evolution is that you know, evolution occurs through changes in allele frequencies in a population. So it's, a, it's probably important enough to repeat. Evolution is changes in allele frequencies in a population. Okay? Now the question is, what, what are the forces that cause allele frequencies to change? And that's what I'm going to be talking about for the next couple lectures. One of them, of course, is natural selection. If one of the alleles is favored, that is to say, um, um, it, it, you know, individuals that bear that allele have a better chance of surviving or reproducing, then that, that allele will tend to increase in frequency over time. But it is worth thinking about what happens to allele frequencies in the absence of any other evolutionary force. What just happens if you just have random mating going on? Okay, what happens to allele frequencies when only random, random mating occurs? And it turns out the, the theory that tells us what happens to allele frequencies only in the presence of random mating is called Hardy-Weinberg Okay, basically uh, this is the first math result that was ever uh, made in the field of population genetics. Weinberg was a, um, a German physician uh, and he, uh, in 1908, gave a lecture on uh, what happens just in the presence of, of random mating. And Hardy, I don't know if you know who Hardy is, but he was a very famous mathematician in, uh, in, in Cambridge, I believe. If you've ever seen Good Will Hunting, uh, you know, the, the genius guy who's really good at math, well, that movie was um, uh, based on a real-life guy who was just like that from, like, around the time of World War I named, Ram uh, was an Indian mathematician named Ramanujan. And uh, basically, it came out of nowhere with all these great ideas. Hardy was the one who discovered this guy and, and brought him to England. Um, and they, they had a lot of fun proving things. Um, but anyways, he was a famous uh, number theorist. And uh, I would imagine that the theory I'm going to describe to you that Hardy did was uh, probably a piece of cake for him, right? No, no thought at all. But it's, it describes what happens uh, to allele frequencies only with random mating. And it's worthwhile asking why this is, in, is interesting. One historical reason why this is interesting is because people um, who had different ideas of how genetics worked back then, some of those ideas, including Darwin's, would have resulted in variation in a population being lost. So for instance, Darwin had this idea of blending inheritance, kind of like mixing paints. And so if you take a, a green paint and a, and a yellow paint, I don't know what do you get when you mix green and yellow, I forget, but you get some other intermediate color, right? Um, and the idea is if you take that intermediate color and then mix it together, you get the same color back out. So the idea is with blending inheritance, you tend to lose variation. You lose, you lose the extremes, right? So if you used to have this type of variation in a population, if genetics worked by a sort of a blending principle, which it doesn't, but if it did, after each generation, you get less and less variation. And some theoretical types pointed out that Darwin's theory you would you know, natural selection would have a real problem if, if genetics really worked this way, if it was blending. Turns out it's not, it's particulate. You have individual genes that are segregating in the population. But the question is, what happens to these alleles in a population? Do some of them leave, get, get reduced in frequency, and others increase naturally? This theory tells us what happens. And, um, and the bottom line is that allele frequencies don't change through the action of, of random mating. Okay, so let's go ahead and work this out. On page um, 473 of of the uh, of the eighth edition, I think it's on page 456 of the seventh edition. They give an example of Hardy-Weinberg uh, frequencies in, in a population, and this is this is basically what you do. So in this example, we have a phenotype. You know what? I'm gonna I want to do this right, so I'm gonna um, erase some more board over here so I have some room. Okay, so we have a phenotype. And in this case, the phenotype is for flower color. So you either have red flowers, pink, or white. Now in this particular instance, the genotype is determined by the phenotype, or that you can actually, I shouldn't say that, the genotype determines the phenotype, but if you know the phenotype, you know the genotype. So in this case, you have an allele called CR. Now, 
Now, it doesn't, you know, you'll notice this in the literature if you ever start to read it at some point, but alleles are named however you want. So as, if, as long as you're the discoverer of the allele. So if you discover a new allele, you get to name it how you want. Okay? So whoever discovered this red uh, allele for the flowers named it C uh, superscript R. Okay? You just live with it. So if you're CR, CR, you have red flowers. If you're CR, CW, you have white flowers. And if you're CW, CW, you also have, uh, you have pink flowers and you have white flowers if you're CW, CW. I think I misspoke, but, but if I did, you know. So as I said, you know, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between genotype and phenotype. That's not always the case. The example I gave earlier where we have brown eyes and blue eyes, you can't necessarily tell the, the genotype from the phenotype. If I told you what the genotype, um, if you have brown eyes, well, you could either be heterozygous or homozygous. You don't know which. Now, in this particular population, we have a count, an observed count for the number of individuals of each genotype, or each phenotype for that matter. There are 320 individuals that are red. You have 160 individuals that are pink. You have 20 individuals that have the white phenotype. That's, that's just the raw count of the number of individuals in the population of each uh, genotype. This count, of course, through some very complicated higher math, will allow us to get the genotype frequency. Okay, so let's go through this. So what is the frequency of the CRCR CR, uh, genotype? Well, it's just 320 divided by the total number of individuals in the population. 320 plus 160 plus 20, that total is 500. Okay, like I said, so we get that, so that's going to be 0 0.64, and we can get the frequency, the genotype frequency of the heterozygous individuals is 160 divided by 500, that's um, 0 0.32, and then you have 20 divided by 500, and that's 0 0.04. Okay, so, so far... We haven't done anything, <laughs> right? We've just written down some numbers. This is the only math we've had to do, and presumably you guys are at Berkeley. That's not so difficult. Now, the, this is where we can start to, this is where we'll end right here. From either the counts or the genotype frequencies, we can calculate the allele frequencies. I'm going to abbreviate those as FCR and F. CW, okay? Often you'll see these, geni these allele frequencies as uh, described as P or Q, right? If you've seen this before. Okay, now this is where I'll, we'll, next lecture uh, I will finish up the discussion of Hardy-Weinberg and then we'll start talking about natural selection and other evolutionary forces.